So good morning. And so this is week five. Today is actually going to be like a continuation of our last week's uh, algebra review where we started solving equations. Today we will move on to uh, an extension of that algorithm and we will start uh, thinking about inverses which we actually saw before but we will be thinking of inverses in terms of how to calculate them given a matrix what's its inverse and also we'll take a look at uh, different shapes of matrices. We will redefine the ranks and then look at uh, some of their properties, some of the properties of the ranks. Okay. And we will expand on the theme of uh, Gaussian elimination and call it Gauss-Jordan elimination. And we will use that to compute inverses too. And we'll talk about properties of inverses, some of which are important for our purposes later on. Then another important topic would be the shapes of matrices. The matrix is a table, is a rectangular array, so it could can be square, can be a rectangle that is a tall, or it can be a rectangle, rectangle that is wide, more columns than rows that would make it wide. And then we look at uh, what they call the canonical form. Canonical is a word that uh, mathematicians just love. The canonical form is the output of a uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination, that is one canonical form. Actually this guy Jordan has a different idea of uh, a canonical form too. There's a different canonical form that this guy will define later in the course. Okay, The rank, we originally defined the rank as uh, the number of pivots in the REF. If a row is a linear combination of other rows, what does that mean? That means an equation, a row is an equation in, uh, in the context of solving uh, equations. A row can be obtained by algebraic manipulations of other other equations that's what that row means which means by doing all these uh, row operations which are like algebraic manipulations on equations that row will get killed meaning it will become a zero row and will get pushed down to the bottom of the the uh, ref of the augmented matrix so every row that is not a zero row will have a pivot because there will be at least one element that is not zero and that one element so that will there will be a pivot so the number of pivots is also the number of uh, rows that cannot be killed and that means it's the number of linearly independent rows. So just as a reminder, we have the three ERO's here, swap in it two rows, which we tried very hard not to use, but we had to use it in some cases. This multiplier row, scaling a row, we did not use and then add a multiple of row, uh, any row to another, which was the mainstay of a Gaussian elimination so that we could get rid of uh, all the elements in uh, one column. By get, get rid of, I mean make them zero. So all non-zero rows in REF will have pivots. So that implies that the rank of uh, a matrix is a number of linearly independent rows in the matrix A. If a row is a linear combination of other rows, Gaussian elimination will make it a zero row. And so this is a number of linearly independent rows in A. That is the rank. But this is a better way of looking at it or more sophisticated way of looking at it because it has implications about the geometry of the spaces defined by the matrix A. So you can also say that is the number of linearly independent columns. Okay, so that also is possible. The number of linearly independent rows, you can call it the row rank, and the number of linearly independent columns, you can call, call it the column rank. So there is a famous theorem, a foundational theorem in linear algebra that says that the row rank is the same as a column rank. When I define row rank and column rank this way, it is not completely obvious why they have to be the same. But if you think of them, think of the rank as the number of pivots, then it's kind of obvious why the row rank and column rank are the same. I'll show you how this can be proven later today. I'll give you an indication of how this is, a, this is why this is true. But you can see the pivot definition of the rank. So number of rows with pivots is the same as the number of columns with pivots. One thing we might want to keep in mind for our purposes uh, in computer science and data science is that our data matrices tend to be tall meaning more rows than columns because you have measurements along a few features or variables and you have more and more measurements coming in more than that this tall matrix the columns tend to be linearly independent because because they are real measurements there's no reason why they will have any kind of uh, linear dependency the rank cannot be more than the total number of rows or columns so let's take a look at a few properties of ranks. Some of them are actually useful in uh, computer science. Some of them are 
more mathematical and interesting only in an academic way. So if I have two matrices A and B of the same size so that they can be added, rank of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of rank. So this sounds like a fairly useless kind of statement. What does it matter? So it can be extended to say that if you have a matrix of rank R, it can be written as a sum of R rank 1 matrices and no more. You cannot have R plus 1 rank 1 matrices because, uh, because of this uh, inequality statement there. Again, that statement also might sound insignificant, but it has some applications, especially when it comes to data compression. Suppose I have a matrix, suppose I have a matrix A that is uh, in R 100 by 100, a fairly largish kind of matrix. How many elements does it have? 100 times 100 is, that is 10K. So if you need to store it, you will need 10K storage uh, locations in memory. Now, suppose I know that uh, this is a rank one matrix. Suppose I know that this is one. What is uh, the row rank is one. What does that mean? It's the number of linearly independent rows. The number of linearly independent rows, that's a row rank. So there's only one row out of the 100 here that is linearly, linearly independent. That's what it means. That means all other 99 rows are actually scalar multiples of this one row. So that's what it means. So in effect, I have 100 elements in one row and 99 numbers scalars. This is what I have. So that's the information in this matrix of uh, 10K numbers. So that's all I need to store. So I need to store really 199. Let's just call it 200. Okay, so 200 numbers. That's a huge saving. That is data compression really. So you just need to store 200 numbers instead of uh, 10,000 numbers. If it is an image, which has let's say four channels and each channel is a is a table of numbers and if you know for some reason that is rank one then that is a huge amount of saving in in uh, storing that it's not a solid color so it might be like a gradient or it might have only one dimension that is changing in other words if you can find some way of uh, saying that my uh, 100 by 100 matrix can be written or there are only five ranks that are significant all other ranks are like noise Okay. That basically means that you need to have only five rows, so that is five times 100, okay, and some linear combination, some numbers that might be like five times 99 or something, 500 basically. So it's about 1000 numbers that you need if you know that the important part of the matrix, the principal components as it were of the matrix are only five. If, if you know that for, from some source, then you need only five such matrices and they can be stored in a, in a 1K as opposed to as opposed to 10K storage locations. So that would be a compression algorithm that you can use and is actually being used in uh, some situations. So there's value there. So this strange looking inequality here does have applications in computer science. That's what I wanted to bring across. Another one also that has uh, significant applications in many places is this guy, rank of A transpose A, is the same as rank of A, A transpose, the same as, as the rank of A and the rank of A transpose. Rank of A and A transpose, they are the same because the number of pivots is the same, the matrix or its transpose. And A transpose A, okay, if you have a data matrix, the ma data matrix is uh, in R M by N, M being much larger than uh, N, M being much larger than N. If I take A transpose, that is going to be a member of uh, R n by m and if i take a transpose a that will be a member of uh, r n by n because this m and this m will cancel off and what is left would be the number of columns number of variables or number of columns that's a small number compared to m which is a number of rows okay so this is a small matrix and the rank of uh, this matrix rank of a is likely to be the number of columns because it's coming from real measurements and uh, the numbers are going to be distinct and not linearly dependent so the rank this is going to be full rank this rank also is going to be n so it's a full rank matrix on the other hand if i take a a transpose that is going to be in r m by m m being uh, much larger than n this is a huge matrix its rank also is uh, n so that means m being much bigger than n this AA transpose is a horribly rank deficient matrix. The rank deficiency is uh, 
is uh, m minus n which is huge so there is no chance in hell that you will be able to invert this with a horribly singular matrix but on the other hand this is a much nicer matrix this is called the gram matrix and this is also will turn out to be the covariance if you do some initial processing of the data so that is a uh, that matrix is quite significant in machine learning has properties that are appropriate in statistical modeling and machine learning so those things are all useful important you know maybe you want to figure out how to prove it i don't remember if i have the proof in the textbook but you will be able to find it somewhere and this one i don't have the proof now there are other properties that the only zero rank matrix is actually the zero matrix zero rank that is a strange concept that basically says that the number of pivots is zero which can happen if all rows are actually zero rows then there is no leading non zero element anywhere so that way it is easy to understand but we also defined the rank as a number of linearly independent uh, rows so the number of linearly independent rows also can be zero which is quite interesting if i have a matrix how do you have number of linearly independent rows equal to zero so that points to the specialness of the zero vector zero is actually a very interesting character in the world of numbers and also in the world of uh, matrices the zero matrix is a very interesting uh, or zero vector i should say is a very interesting kind of uh, vector if i have a zero vector zero vector and if i take uh, any other vector any vector a okay I multiply by zero of course you get uh, zero vector okay so zero vector scalar multiple of any other vector which is remember scalar multiples of a vector will be on the same line as the vector that's what we said right in the beginning so zero is actually on the same line as any other vector let's call that collinearity parallel so zero vector is actually parallel to any other vector so that means zero is parallel to any vector you can find now how do you define perpendicularity we said that uh, if a dot b equal to zero then that implies a is orthogonal to b which is another word for perpendicularity but we know that a dot zero is always zero because it's uh, some product of the of the elements so a one times zero plus a two times zero etc so is zero that what does that mean that means zero is also perpendicular to any vector that you can find so zero is a very strange entity parallel and perpendicular to everything else one more thing is that if we have a zero matrix suppose i have a, a square matrix a n by n is all zeros the number of linearly independent rows here is not one it's actually zero you can say using the lingo of a set theory the rank of this matrix is the number of uh, linearly independent rows which is the cardinality of the set of linearly independent rows and if the set is actually just the zero vector its cardinality its cardinality which means the number of elements in that set is not one but actually zero that is what that statement says so another property much like uh, the summation property the rank of a product is less than or equal to the product of the ranks another one is that if b is a full column rank matrix full column rank we we'll call it a full rank also then rank of ab is just the rank of a which comes from this and the the column picture of matrix multiplication if b is a full row rank matrix which is again something that you will call full rank then rank of ba is the same as rank of a that comes from the row picture of matrix multiplication okay let's move on to shapes of matrices i call the matrix a matrix tall if it is called more rows and columns a is a member of uh, r m by n and m is larger than n more rows than columns and the if the columns are linearly independent which will be the case in most uh, data science applications then we will call it a full column rank matrix and we will call it also a full rank matrix because the maximum rank it can have is a number of uh, columns and it does have it so full column rank is the same as full rank so most ma data matrices will have m much larger than n with full column rank that's the situation that you will have in most cases if in this case you think of the matrix as encoding a system of linear equations then obviously you have too many equations and you will not be able to solve it you cannot solve but you might still want to ask yourself what's the best possible solution so too many equations you cannot solve that's the situation a wide matrix which i think uncharitably you might call it a fat matrix which is the one with more columns than rows and the rows are if the rows are linearly independent that would mean that is a full row rank matrix if it is a full row rank matrix then ax equal to b is a situation in which you have uh, fewer equations than unknowns and you will have an infinity of solutions 
unless there is inconsistency under specified unconstrained or under constraint situation now let's talk about full rank once more for a square matrix full rank means the rank is assigned as a number of rows and the number of columns and if it is not full rank then the rank deficiency is the number of rows or number of columns minus the rank and if it is a tor matrix if all the columns are independent then it's got full column rank and otherwise the rank deficiency is the number of uh, columns minus the actual rank that it does have a wide matrix on the other hand if all the rows are independent then it's a full row rank matrix otherwise it's got a rank deficiency which is the same as the number of rows minus uh, the rank that it has full column or full row rank we will call it full rank because that has the maximum possible rank it can have gauss jordan elimination so that is the topic of the day in gaussian elimination we got the row echelon form this is the row echelon form which was an upper triangular matrix and in order to be able to solve the system of linear equations represented by the matrix a you had to do back substitution but if you think about it back substitution also is an elementary row operation it's a scaling of a row and then subtracting it from the rows above what uh, the ref gave you the the upper triangular matrix gave you the number of pivots and the product of the diagonal elements would give you the determinant if a was a square matrix now back substitution as i said is an ero if you go ahead and perform the back substitution also starting from the ref that would be the gauss jordan elimination so gauss jordan elimination is the same as gaussian elimination plus the back substitution so that you actually get the solution in the matrix form so an example will make it clear so we have our favorite equations x plus y equal to 5 x minus y equal to 1 so how we did the gaussian elimination is to get the the augmented matrix x plus y equal to 5 x minus y equal to 1 and then subtract row 1 from row 2 to kill this leading uh, non zero in uh, the second row okay so the elementary operation was the first row of the augmented matrix is the same as the, the first row of the ref of the augmented matrix is the first same as the first row of the augmented matrix which means i took one of the first row and zero of the second row so that just gave me the first row the second row i took minus one of the first row and one of the second row that summation is basically subtracting the first row from the second row that was the elementary operation so that's how i got this guy that is first elementary operation we might call that e1 then in order to do the gauss jordan elimination i have to do two more things i want to make sure that the pivots are all one which is easy to do by scaling so i have a pivot row here that had minus two in the pivot position i just scale it by uh, one over minus two just divide by minus two so that is a second operation here what does it say the first row because the pivot was already one i didn't have to do anything so first row is the first row plus zero of the second row second row zero of the first row plus minus half of the second row that is basically divide the second row by minus two or multiply the second row by minus half so i get one there so it was a second operation so that is one objective of uh, gauss jordan elimination done i have the pivot solved one now now the second objective is to get rid of all the elements above the pivot uh, in any column so using the pivot here i can get rid of all the elements above it how would i do it i just have to subtract from the first row the second row then one will subtract away from one here so this one will become zero and then something will happen here but nothing will have to happen to the first pivot because everything below that is zero anyway so this subtracting second row from the first row that is the third elementary operation the first row becomes first row minus one times the second row the second row nothing happens to it is zero times the first row plus uh, one times the second row so that's how you look at the or you build the elementary operators so the non-pivot became zero so those are the two things i want to do now if you look at the matrix here after gauss jordan elimination this guy and if you look at just the coefficient part what do you see it's the identity matrix so the objective of gauss jordan elimination is try to get the identity matrix in the coefficient part if you cannot get the identity matrix get as close to it as possible that's what we're trying to do so if we can get to the identity matrix then the augmented matrix becomes identity matrix uh, augmented by some numbers some constants and what are the constants now actually what does this augmented matrix actually say in terms of equations this is my augmented matrix the output of gauss jordan elimination which we call reduced row echelon form what does that mean 
this is the same as writing the identity matrix times the x vector is equal to whatever you see in the augmented part 3 2 and x vector is just now I just carry out the multiplication what does it say it's 1 times x plus 0 times y so the top row basically just says x equal to 3 the bottom row is 0 times x plus 1 times y that just says y is equal to 2 what we did essentially was back substitution is a codification of back substitution in terms of elementary operations so the upper triangular matrix in the row echelon form is the output of a Gaussian elimination so this upper triangular matrix here this guy here which is upper triangular because everything below the main diagonal there's a main diagonal everything below that is zero the coefficient part of the part will become the identity matrix or as close to the identity matrix as possible in the reduced row echelon form or RREF that is the output of gauss jordan elimination so gauss jordan elimination gives you reduced row echelon form or RREF which is REF with a couple of more properties REF you know the row zero rows will have to be at the bottom of the matrix and the pivot in any row the pivot has to be to the right of the pivots in the rows above now the gauss jordan starting from the ref it adds a couple of more properties it scales scales the pivot rows by the pivot value divided by the pivot value so that you get uh, one in the pivot positions then it goes ahead one more step uses the the pivot value in any row to get rid of the the elements above the pivot so they subtract appropriate multiples of that row from the rows above so it actually goes down the Gaussian elimination it goes down first and then it goes back up to get rid of all the elements above it above each pivot which is basically back substitution so RREF is REF with some extra properties now REF as you know as you may know it's not unique you perform the Gaussian elimination since you have the freedom of, uh, of swapping any two rows you might get different uh, REF row echelon form for the same matrix but RREF on the other hand is unique for a matrix there's only one RREF given the matrix so that's the reason why people like to call it a canonical form because it's a unique form now let's talk about the algorithm how it actually does it so one way of doing it would be to run the Gaussian elimination first to get the REF then start from the REF and do a couple of more loop do one more loop take each pivot row and scale it by one over pivot to make the pivots unity and then loop over the rows above and subtract away the appropriate multiple of the, the pivot row to get rid of all the elements above that is a second step so this is Gaussian elimination is one loop there's a second loop on top of it now the second thing that we already saw was that if the RREF of uh, some matrix turns out to be the identity matrix and you have some values in the constants column the augmented column then that is basically saying that x y z is equal to 1 2 3 because identity multiplying any vector just gives you that vector back that also means one more thing if you can find a unique solution then the rref will always have an identity matrix standing here that means all the equations with the same number of equations and the same number of variables all of them will have a coefficient part reduced to the identity matrix for all of them so all non-singular invertible matrices will draw reduce to the identity matrix later on we will call that row equivalent so all the non-singular matrices are row equivalent to the identity matrix and they are also column equivalent to an identity matrix that's just a name what it means, means is that all non-singular matrices will reduce to the identity matrix because all non-singular matrices can be inverted that means all non-singular matrices have a unique solution if it is the coefficient part of a system of linear equations do we still use rref if matrix is not full rank yes we will see that you can get rref in which case the this part the coefficient part may not be identity identity matrix but it's as close to the identity matrix as you can get okay, that's what the gauss jordan elimination will give you so there is an rref for all matrices so the moment you have i augmented by a b prime then x equal to b prime all in vector lingo is the solution now let's look at the shapes of different matrices and some examples so if a square matrix is full rank then that means the rank is the same as the number of rows or number of columns and all the rows and columns are linearly independent obviously and all the rows will end up having pivots because when you do the row re reduction you will get pivots in all rows because they're all linearly independent and they can be scaled so that uh, they, you get ones there and each pivot column you can use the one in the pivot column now to get rid of the, the stuff above it 
which means you can always reduce it to the identity matrix. So all invertible, non-singular, full rank matrices will flow reduce to the identity matrix of the same size. But on the other hand, if it is rank deficient, it's a bit more complicated. So rank R is less than N now. So what you will get will be R rows and columns that are independent, which will give R non-zero pivot rows, which will be at the top of the matrix in the RREF form. So the bottom N minus R rows will be zeros. So I will write it this way. Okay. So there will be R rows in the top. That is what this IR means. But I have this funny symbol, which is again not a standard symbol. I just use the symbol to mean that there is a matrix with the columns of the identity matrix and some other columns in between that will be at the top. So let me actually show you an example that will make it clearer. So let me show you a full rank example first. I have a system of equations here. And if I write down the, the augmented matrix, I have x plus y plus z equal to 6, 2x plus 2y plus 1 equal to 9 x plus 3y plus 0z equal to 7. Then I do the R REF, I get that, an upper triangular matrix, run a Gauss Jordan on it, identity matrix here because it's a full rank matrix, and 1, 2, 3, which will be the solution. So this is obvious. So this full rank matrix that became the identity matrix. On the other hand, if the third equation was x plus y equal to 3, which turns out to be not linearly independent of the previous two. My augmented matrix, the first two columns are the same. The last one reads x plus y plus 0 z equal to 3. And if I run REF, I get a 0 row down here. And if I run RREF, I can scale the second row by minus 1 to get uh, 1 here. That is fine. So 1 and 3 instead of minus 1 and minus 3. I just flip the signs. And I can use this one now to get rid of the uh, value above just subtract it away so that becomes zero and this becomes a six minus three three so this is the rref form what do you have i have a matrix with identity matrix standing here and here okay in those two columns if you look at it is one zero and zero one that is an identity matrix but in between i have a column which actually corresponds to a free variable that is what i wrote here as an identity matrix of size the rank the rank of uh, the three by three matrix there was two because two uh, pivots so a two by two identity matrix but with some uh, matrix representing the free variables it's not not cleanly separated now it is possible to say that you can perform elementary column operations to push these uh, these columns together so that you get an IR cleanly separated but that's not the right thing to do because by swapping the the second and third column this is remember this is x column this is y column this is z column if i swap these two then i'm calling z y and y z so i'm actually changing something the solution set but there is an identity matrix standing here and there is a free variable column standing there so that's what it is now if the matrix is a uh, tall and full rank tall means uh, more rows and columns tall matrix full rank means columns are linearly independent all columns will have pivots which can be scaled to one the pivots can be used to get rid of elements above and below so what you will have will be an identity matrix and the m minus r the extra rows will all become zeros so you will have a shape like this i n standing on top n is the rank so it's the same as i r near the top and everything else below that will be zero so that's a clean separation of uh, the identity matrix and uh, the zero zero rows if it is rank deficient again the situation is less than ideal you will have r columns that are linearly independent which will give an ir in the top but not necessarily to the left it might be again shuffled in with the free variable columns but the bottom m minus r rows will be zeros so the shape will have something like this let's again look at an example to make it clear so here i added one more equation linearly dependent equation so that the last row became all zero so the extra equation i added to the previous set reads x plus 2y plus 3z equal to 14 okay that is consistent with the rest so a zero row there the moment is consistent it cannot be independent so i have an identity matrix if you just look at this part which is a coefficient part I have the identity matrix standing on top with zero row, one zero row standing below. And if I make sure that the second last equation also is linearly dependent, so these two 
equations are linearly dependent so these two rows will uh, become uh, zero rows that means in the ref i have only two pivots for four columns and three rows rank deficiency is maximum possible rank minus the actual rank so the maximum possible rank was three has a rank of two so rank deficiency is uh, is one all right so if you again look at only that part i have a minus one here which i scaled to make it one and then i subtract away from the previous row so that i get zero there so i get again only in this part uh, an identity matrix but in between i have the column corresponding to the free variable if you have a wide matrix you have more columns than rows okay and uh, it's interesting to see what the, the canonical form of that matrix would be so if the matrix is a full rank what's going to happen is that all the rows are linearly independent all of them will have a pivots there will, will not be any zero row if you have a pivot then you can of course take the pivot and scale the row by that pivot or the reciprocal of the pivot to, to make the pivots one so all the pivots can be one and then you can use the pivot to get rid of uh, the co the elements in the column above the pivot so that means there will be an identity matrix of size r which is the same as the number of rows size r which is the same as m the rest of the the columns will correspond to pivotless columns and uh, they correspond to free variables but unfortunately for us we cannot guarantee that the identity matrix hiding inside the rref will be to the left free variable columns might be in between somewhere so everything is shuffled in which is what i mean by this uh, this uh, funny symbol if it is rank deficient then the rank is going to be less than the number of rows then what you will have will be an identity matrix of size r near the top in the the first r rows of the rref you will have an identity matrix again not cleanly separated but somewhere there and the rest of the rows will of course be zeros because every linearly dependent row will become zero using the gaussian elimination steps so the n minus r columns that is a number of uh, columns minus the actual rank will correspond to free variables there will be n minus r free variables again they may not be to the right of the identity matrix they may be somewhere in between rref will have this form whereby you have an identity matrix of size r the rank this time kind of shuffled in with free variable columns with number of columns equal to n minus r and then you will have m minus r rows that are pivotless rows those are zero rows in the bottom so that's the general shape so here i have three variables so three columns and uh, two equations two, so two rows so if you just look at the coefficient part of it it's a two by three matrix and if you run rref on the whole the augmented matrix the first first thing you will do is of course run ref so we subtract twice the first row from the second row you will get that so zero zero minus one and uh, minus three then of course you have minus one and uh, uh, minus three here so you can scale it by minus one and you will make that those things positive so the pivots are positive once now now above the pivot here there is a one you can subtract away the pivot row from uh, the the row above to get uh, zero there so of course augmented side you will get a three the rref again you can see that there is an identity matrix zero one one zero hiding there but in between you have this uh, free variable column and if you go to a similar set of equations in now added one more variable w but essentially the same set of uh, equations so what i have now is w plus x plus y plus z equal to 6 that's the first equation and 0 w plus 2x plus 2y plus z equal to 9 and minus w plus x plus y plus 0 z equal to 3 gauss jordan elimination you will try to make this guy 1 by dividing by 2 so that also will become 1 this becomes half this becomes 9 by 2 and then you will use that row so these two are ones subtract away from the previous row so those ones will go away but essentially you're trying to make this zero but in the process you got this also to be zero but that's okay and then this became a half and that became some number so that is the, the rref of a general wide matrix in which you had some zero rows the rank was only two as you can see here in ref you had only two pivots so the rank was a two and so two rows in the the top and there is an identity matrix this time not hiding that well it's actually right here of size 2 by 2 because the rank is 2 and then the rest are some numbers but the 0 row 1 0 row because that is 1 is a rank deficiency in this case in the bottom so that's the general shape of a wide matrix 
that is rank deficient. So summarizing these things, if you have a full rank matrix, if it is square, you get a clean identity matrix. If it is star matrix, you get identity on top and zero rows below. If it is wide, the clean separation of the identity and the free variable matrices is not guaranteed. If it is rank deficient, clean separation is never guaranteed. If the zero row, rows will happen at the bottom, but there will be free variable columns which might kind of mess up your identity matrix a little bit. Now, what we are using are all elementary row operations, but we have the freedom to use elementary column operations too without affecting the rank. But it actually does affect the solution set, but not the rank. Okay, so it's possible to bring all the identity matrix to one corner, to the, to the top left corner, without affecting the rank. Then you will get an identity matrix of size R by R, and that will represent the column rank as well as the row rank. That's why uh, the row rank is the same as the, the column rank, and that's actually the proof. The fact that you can apply column operations without affecting the rank and bring the identity matrix to the top left corner, and then you can just look at it and say that the rank of the original matrix is the rank of the identity matrix because everything else is uh, basically either zero, yeah, basically zero uh, rows or zero columns. And that is the proof that the row rank is the same as the column rank, okay? But you cannot do column operations and expect to have the solution set unchanged because you're renaming the variables when you do the column operations. Now you're not just renaming, you're actually doing more than that. You're actually changing the solution set. And now it's time to do the inverse matrices, inverse of a matrix. We are actually did this when we were talking about uh, elementary row operations, elementary row operations. We uh, talked about the, the matrix E that encodes the elementary row operation and it's inverse, not by actually computing it, but saying that inverse is something that does the reverse of what the original one does. And then just figuring out how that can be returned. That's how we did it. That works fine for elementary matrices because they're elementary, they're fairly simple. But in, for a general matrix, it doesn't work. So we need another mechanism by which you can, uh, another technique by which you can actually compute it for any matrix, okay? So what we did for elementary matrices was actually a special case. So remember, inverses are defined only for square matrices to begin with. And it basically says, if there is A, it's inverse, multiplying it A on the left or on the right will give you identity matrix, which basically means that if you have, if you have AX equal to B, I can multiply on the left by its inverse. That will kind of nullify what A does and makes it identity, which does nothing. So I get X is equal to A inverse B because I'm multiplying on the left by A inverse on both sides of the equation. So A inverse is something that reverses the operation of A. So that is the intuitive uh, understanding of the inverse defined only for uh, square matrices and the inverse in the world of matrices is similar to the reciprocal in the world of numbers because if you take a number multiply by another number to reverse the operation of the other number that multiplied it you just have to divide by it which is like multiplying by its reciprocal which is similar to what we have if you think of uh, ax and b as numbers this equation still holds x is equal to the reciprocal of a times b okay, if you just think of them as numbers so it's similar to the reciprocal except for one number it are all other numbers have reciprocals zero doesn't have a reciprocal so if you multiply any number by zero it becomes zero and uh, you cannot multiple things will go to the single number zero so given zero you don't know where it came from so you cannot reverse that operation which is why zero doesn't have a reciprocal. Similarly, some matrices don't have reciprocals. It's not a, a single matrix that doesn't have a reciprocal. It's not just a zero matrix, which is, uh, uh, which, is, mm, uh, which is singular, but other matrices also can be singular. In particular, if a row is actually zero, or two rows are the same, then uh, those matrices are singular. So it's not just one zero in the world of matrices, many matrices that are, that are singular. So the word single, the word singular doesn't mean one, but it uh, means uh, things that cannot be inverted, okay? So the necessary and sufficient condition for a matrix to be, to be able to be inverted is uh, that its determinant not be equal to zero. So if and only if that's the way mathematicians like to write and they write to con like to contract it by just saying if with two Fs, okay? So that is something that you might see or might have already seen 
in uh, different places okay so that's the inverse of a matrix so uh, if the inverse exists then we give it uh, some good names we give the matrix some good names if it doesn't exist we call the matrix bad names so if a is not invertible then it is singular it is degenerate otherwise it is invertible it's got n pivots it's full rank it's a good matrix okay and the system there's another one a x equal to b has a unique solution because a is a square matrix it's full rank that means it's got a unique solution and a fancier way of saying it is that a represents a linear automorphism that is one to one and onto mapping so this is a fancy word again words are not important it's just what they mean that is important the concepts underlying the words so it basically means there's a transformation from a space to the same space and it's one to one one vector will transform to a, another vector no two vectors will transform to the same vector if they did then you cannot invert it because given the output vector you don't know where it came from you cannot invert it so this kind of stuff i will not typically test you in uh, in exams because i don't i cannot really remember all these names and i don't expect you to be remembering names either but i would like you to know the the concept concepts behind it okay another way of saying it is that a a square matrix is row or column equivalent to the identity matrix what that means the equivalency in terms of columns or rows will become even more more obvious uh, in a couple of weeks but for now just understand that if you take a non singular matrix do gauss jordan on it you will get an identity matrix okay so that's what what it says here okay now some properties of the inverses an inverse of an inverse is the original matrix obviously so it is doing it twice if you have an inverse you can invert it again and that will give you the original matrix okay scaling a matrix its inverse gets scaled by the reciprocal of the scaling factor which is kind of neat because that's what you would expect okay so you can prove it formally it probably doesn't need any proof but if you want to prove it you can just do a one line proof like this similarly there's a product rule kind of identical to the product rule of transposes if you take the inverse of a product it's the product of the inverses but taken in the opposite uh, opposite order reverse order again you can actually prove it by just using the definition of the inverse or just multiplying this by the original matrix and then finding an identity somewhere all these proofs will involve the identity matrix in between some of the matrices that's how you would prove all of them again i don't want to read out the proof i would like you to just look at the proof and understand it because reading it out doesn't make too much sense then there is a name another name okay again names i cannot really remember a matrix that is its own inverse is called involutory involutory okay permutation matrices implementing a single row exchange if you want to reverse it you just do the same exchange once more so the inverse is the same as itself so those matrices are involutory and another important thing to remember is the determinant of the inverse the reciprocal of the determinant this also is a nice property because you think of inverse as similar to the reciprocal in the world of numbers so this also is a nice property and also it looks nice when you write it as a as a formula a inverse determinant is a determinant of a inverse one over that okay now this part is important how you compute inverses there are a couple of uh, formulas but the coolest way of doing it is by using gauss jordan method okay so this i will spend a couple of slides explaining it to you so what you would do is to do Ga run the gauss jordan algorithm on the augmented matrix of a but not any odd augmentation but augmented by i so far we have seen augmentation of a matrix by a single column but you can think of augmenting it with a whole matrix if you want let's just put in other matrix next to the current matrix so you have i and n by n matrix a sorry a and n by n matrix i also an n by n matrix just put them side by side that is the augmented matrix then run the uh, gauss jordan elimination to get the rref reduced row echelon form then what you will get is i on the uh, left hand side on the left side of the augmented matrix left block and a inverse on the right block this you know by running a uh, gauss jordan elimination you know that if it is a full rank matrix you are supposed to get i here but what you will get on the other side is a inverse which is quite neat and in interesting okay i haven't i just told you this 
I will prove it to you. I will prove it to you in a very fancy way in the next slide. But I want to tell you something about it. It's, it's actually a computationally very efficient because all the, the raw operations are, are computationally efficient and there is a, there are there is this finite series of uh, uh, raw operations that you have to do before you get to the final answer. So it is, uh, it is guaranteed to converge within a given number of uh, operations which will turn out to be twice the number of rows or something like that. Okay, computationally efficient and determined. So Gauss Jordan is a series of elementary operations as you know and row operations are linear combinations of the rows. So if you think about applying Gauss Jordan to uh, a matrix then it's the same as multiplying the matrix on the left by E an elementary operator or a series of elementary operators. Okay now that is one piece that you will use in the proof. Another piece is the blockwise multiplication that we saw in the first chapter. So if you have all n by n matrices all these guys are n by n matrices so b augmented by c this whole matrix is one matrix here that's got n rows and two n columns because you have the columns of b and then you have the columns of c and if you want to do the product you can actually write it uh, by blockwise multiplication so d times b augmented by c is the same as db augmented by dc almost like distributing the matrix d inside this works and you can verify it if you want to remember bc is a matrix even though you have this augmentation vertical bar there that doesn't really do anything to the computation that is just for you to see that these are actually two different matrices standing side by side even if you didn't have it that uh, if, when you write it in terms of uh, the elements and numbers the bar is not necessary to have to have but just remember that there are n columns coming from here n columns coming from here so this wide matrix will have two n columns so this is a uh, the second piece we'll use these two pieces to prove that uh, a i gauss jordan will give you i a inverse so let's see how that works this is going to be using a uh, matrix algebra so it is an elegant sophisticated kind of proof and very easy to do also so let's say that i'm applying gauss jordan to a i a aug augmented by i i know that i will get i here and we'll know that I'll get something there. I don't know what it is. So let's let's start from there. So let me call it M. Now I also know, so this is a not an equation. This is a process step as it were. I'm saying that I'm applying Gauss Jordan to get that. But I can make that an equation by understanding that Gauss Jordan is an operation on the left by a matrix. It's an elementary operator, a series of elementary operations, all compacted into one, multiplying on the left. That is what's going to implement the Gauss Jordan operation or my augmented matrix here. So then it becomes an equality, so it becomes an equation, then I can do things to it, okay? Now the second thing I know is the blockwise multiplication. So E A I will become E A I will become E A and E I, but E I, I multiplying E is the same as E. I doesn't change it, okay? So E A and E, and on the right hand side, right from the beginning I have that, I am, okay? Now, what I can do is to compare blockwise. Each block in this part, each block has to match. This block will have to be, so that block will have to be I, because that's why, that's what the equality says. And then the second block, the green block, will have to be M. So what does that say? So I'll have to say EI, EA is equal to I, EA is equal to I. What does that mean? Something multiplying A is giving me I. That means that something that is multiplying A has to be the inverse of A. So that means, E has to be the inverse of A. That is the definition of the inverse. Okay. Now the second block tells me that E, that something that is multiplying A, is actually M. Okay. E is equal to M. So what I have in the position of A, e, position of M, is actually A inverse. So that is just a blockwise multiplication and comparison block by block that gives me the answer. So basically it says E it has to be equal to M and E also has to be equal to A inverse. So M has to be equal to A inverse. So the Gauss Jordan elimination will give me I and A inverse. I know that this proof is a is a bit too matrixy, meaning it uses matrix algebra, and you may not be convinced of it. So for that reason, in the textbook, I have one more proof, which is a, a bit less sophisticated. So if you're not convinced of this proof, this, this is actually true. This proof is actually true. Really, this is the right proof, this is the right elegant proof. But there's one way, one more way of looking at it and uh, you can read it up in the textbook okay 
Now, that is uh, the right way of computing the, uh, the inverse because it's computationally efficient. But remember minors and cofactors, they can also be used to define an inverse. So minors where minor of a11 is de deleting that row, that column and that row and taking the sub matrix there and finding its determinant, that would be the minor. And the minor, the determinant is a minor, it's not the sub matrix, it's the determinant that is a minor. The minor with the associated sign is a cofactor. So cofactor is plus or minus the minor, minor the right sign. Okay, so this we saw when we defined determinant in terms of minors and cofactors, which was a bad idea computationally. Okay, so once I have the cofactors, remember cofactors are actually just determinants with some sign, so they're, they're just numbers. So I can arrange them in, uh, in a matrix, and that matrix has got uh, a name that we can just call it cofactor matrix C. Then you can transpose it, and that guy has got a lot of different names. It's called the adjunct, classical adjoint, adjugate, etc. Since it's got so many different names, I presume this cofactor transpose got some deep significance in linear algebra and the theory behind it. But for us, this is the only place where we're going to see it. Okay. So I'm going to use the, the name adjugate. Okay. So inverse of a matrix is defined in terms of the adjugate matrix, which is the transpose of the cofactor matrix. So A inverse is 1 over the determinant of A times the cofactor transpose, which is the adjugate matrix. So there is a transpose to be computed, many cofactors to be computed. So this is computationally expensive, not as nice as uh, the Gauss-Jordan method, but this is the closed formula. And uh, nice to write it down mathematically, it looks neat, better than a Gauss-Jordan method in terms of mathematics. But computationally, this is not the right thing to do. Okay. Just to clarify, does that, so question is, for any matrix, if it has an inverse at all, if it is invertible, the inverse is unique. Yeah, that is true. If A has a non-zero determinant, there's only one inverse, there cannot be two, okay? That is the same as saying that if AX equal to B has a solution, a unique solution, the solution is unique. It is A inverse times B, and you cannot have two different A inverses giving two different solutions. There's only one unique solution, okay? That is one part, the cofactor method, cofactor matrix, uh, transposive, transpose of it, divided by the determinant, then you get the inverse. Although it is computationally not very nice, let's just do this for uh, a two by two matrix, a general matrix. I'm not taking numbers, I'm taking A, B, and C, D. We know that the determinant is A, D minus B, C, A, D minus B, C. Now the cofactor matrix, cofactor of A is delete that co that column, that row, I get D, so that's a cofactor of uh, A. Cofactor of C will come with a negative sign because C is in 1, 1 position. So 1, 2 position, so minus 1 to the power 1 plus uh, 2, 3, so that is minus 1. And the cofactor is the minor is B, so the cofactor is minus B. Similarly, you get minus C and A. So cofactor transpose will become D, A in the diagonal and uh, minus C minus uh, B in the other diagonal. Okay, so it's D minus B minus C A. That is a cofactor transpose. And now the inverse is defined as the cofactor transpose, adjugate matrix, divided by the determinant. So I get that. The determinant here, the cofactor transpose here. So this is something that you have to remember, not in terms of uh, the, the symbols I used here, but remember it this way. In order to get the inverse of a two by two matrix, swap the diagonal elements. So a and B swap them okay and switch the sign of the down diagonal elements it was B and C it was B and C switch the the sign make it minus B minus C and divide the whole thing by the determinant these three things steps you have to remember so if I give you a matrix 1 5 3 2 or something like that and ask you to write down the inverse you can just look at it and just write it down okay so that you have to remember it's a foundational thing so better remember that part all right Okay, Roisin has a question which says, for two by two matrix, how do we derive the cofactor matrix? Cofactor matrix, what is the cofactor? It's not a matrix, cofactor is a number. What is the sub matrix of A? So delete that column and delete that row. You get D, that is a sub matrix, okay? D inside the uh, square brackets would be the sub matrix and it's, uh, what's its determinant? 
B. It's only it's a one by one matrix, so it remains the same as itself. So that is B. So that is the the minor. What's the cofactor? Minor with the associated sign. All right. That comes because minor with the associated sign is the cofactor. What's the minor? Minus minor for C. The minor for C. Delete that row, that column. You get B. That is a minor. What's the associated sign? Minus one to the power by what? Minus one to the power what? What's the position of C? That is a uh, row one, column two. So one and two, one and two. One plus two is three. So minus one to the power three. That is minus one. Okay. All right. Good. So moving on from there. So if it is a square matrix, and if it is not singular, then you have an inverse. But if it is a rectangular ma matrix, inverse is not even defined. Okay. By the way, the inverse that we had, a inverse. I said a inverse a is equal to a a inverse equal to i. So that means I can write, uh, I can multiply it on the right or the left, multiply it on the left or the right to get i. So it is called a double-sided inverse because it's the same matrix multiplying on the left or right giving me i. That is possible only for a square matrix. If there is an inverse, it is a double-sided inverse and uh, it's the same. That is always true. You can actually prove it. I think it is either proven in the textbook or is an exercise in the textbook. Okay. On the other hand, for a rectangular matrix, you cannot define uh, an inverse that way, but you might still want to have something like an inverse. Okay. If M is not equal to N, this is a rectangular matrix. Let's take the example of a tall matrix, which is more important for us. So it is, suppose it's full rank. That means number of columns is less than the number of rows, so more rows than columns. So it's a tall matrix. A transpose A is a small matrix and it is full rank because A is full rank. A transpose A has the same rank as uh, A and it is invertible because it is full rank. Okay. So this guy can be inverted. What does that mean? So that means A transpose A multiplied by whatever inverse it has, has to be I. I can multiply on the, the left or right. I choose to multiply on the left. So if you look at that multiplication here, and kind of group these guys up to here and call that something and call that something and that becomes uh, something that is multiplying a on the left and giving you i okay something that's multiplying a on the left and giving you i it is of the form some matrix b multiplying a and giving you i so that is in that case i can call it a inverse but remember a is not square matrix so there's no real inverse so i should actually call it a inverse on the left so it is a left uh, it's a left inverse multiplying a on the left i get i but if i try to multiply on the right i cannot even multiply on the right because this is not of the, the right dimension okay so this is the left inverse so that's the definition of the left inverse okay it is called the left inverse and it actually does something like what an inverse would do but for a rectangular matrix similarly if i take a wide and full rank matrix then A, A transpose is a small matrix and because M is less than N, so that's a small matrix and the rank is M, so this is full rank and I have A, A transpose and I multiply on the right this time with its own uh, inverse, inverse of the, the product and that because this guy can be defined, that is I and now I choose to look at this much. So that is A multiply, something multiplying A on the right giving me I so that's the, of the form AB equal to I. So B is like an inverse, but this is the right inverse. This is the right inverse. Okay. So that's the definition of the right inverse. Again, you cannot take the right inverse and multiply on the left because uh, the multiplication will not work. Uh, it will not be compatible for multiplication, I believe. All right. So that's the left and right inverses. Now there's just one more thing, which is called a Kramer's rule. Kramer's rule is a theorem very beautiful mathematically but uh, quite useless computationally okay so the formal solution for ax equal to b is that a inverse b but there is a kramer's rule which will give you each element of uh, the solution x okay which reads the determinant of a j by determinant of a so determinant of a comes in the denominator a j i haven't defined what a j is a j is a matrix, the same matrix as the coefficient matrix, but the jth column replaced by the constant's vector. Okay, so it looks quite neat to write it that way, and it looks like a beautiful formula. But again, you have to compute two different determinants. Actually, 
n different determinants in the top and one more determinant in the bottom and that's horrible computation as you know determinant computation is just quite quite bad it's not easy to do cow order elimination will give you this uh, solution at least n times faster i think okay. so the, but this is kramer's rule mathematically probably quite nice okay that actually brings us to the end of the algebraic view we started with the basic part the numerical computations the first part was uh, just defining linear algebra, uh, linearity in linear algebra what it means and how that led to the concept of uh, vectors and why we came up with this uh, table of numbers so that we could write systems of linear equations in a compact form we did that and then we talked about uh, the operations on vectors and matrices and how linearity actually manifested itself in the operations and then we moved on to the definitions of transposes determinants and their properties that's that kind of finished the first part the second part was algebraic view while the first part was three chapters the second part was only two chapters basically gaussian elimination and gauss jordan elimination gaussian elimination plus back substitution is essentially gauss jordan elimination and gauss jordan elimination can can compute inverses because by doing gaussian elimination and back substitution you're getting to the solution the solution as you know is basically a inverse times the constant vector b so a inverse is there implicitly somewhere in gauss jordan which is what we made explicit explicit we brought it out and uh, we showed that that is actually gauss jordan on a augmented by i will give you uh, the the inverse okay now in the algebraic view we saw that the algebraic view was basically essent about solving equations gauss jordan a uh, gaussian elimination plus back substitution will give you the solution gauss jordan elimination will give you the solution directly which is not very different from uh, gaussian elimination form plus back substitution then if you have inverse uh, if a the coefficient matrix is full rank square then you have an inverse and then x can be written formally as a inverse b or you could use a uh, kramer's rule also so four different ways of doing it and but remember inverse and kramer's rule will work only in the ideal situation you have a unique solution and uh, a is invertible etc they are also computationally expensive and apparently numerically not very stable either so bad things to consider if you are doing it uh, on a computer okay so that kind of completed our algebraic view which is which was about solving systems of linear equations now while looking at the solutions of uh, simple equations like x plus y equal to 5 x minus y equal to 1 we drew lines and looked at the intersection that may have looked like geometry but that's geometry in a, in what we might call the coordinate space the x y plane or x y z space or something like that that's not the geometry of linear algebra that we will start next week which will be the sophisticated view of linear algebra matrices and solutions and everything it's the basis of uh, the next phase of our understanding of uh, linear algebra the coordinate space is a collection of points where you can have lines and uh, and uh, planes and uh, and different curves etc but the the spaces the vector spaces that we will deal with in uh, linear algebra are actually more primitive they are just sets of vectors so all you have in a vector space is a collection of vectors nothing more nothing more so you don't have lines and lines and uh, planes etc those are all in coordinate space so there's a different idea of spaces that we will come up with and to the extent possible we will try to distinguish between these two in the following classes at times it might be might be interesting to think of vector spaces also as coordinate spaces there will be some overlap for one good reason that we will understand later but theoretically a vector space is a set it's a set of all possible vectors of a given dimension that would be the vector space okay that's the way we'll look at it starting next week and in the vector space also the equations will form some kind of geometry matrices also will form some kind of geometry and the properties of those uh, geometries will be our mainstay starting next week okay that will be more exciting more more uh, sophisticated university level linear algebra so far i think everything was kind of like maybe high school level junior jc level okay all right any questions so far need to see reds before i can move on i want to see red all right good so let me just summarize so we defined the rank of matrices and uh, their properties we started with last week's definition which was rank is the same as the number of pivots 
Now, this week we also said rank is the number of linearly dependent rows or, or columns. Same thing because the linearly dependent rows will have uh, pivots and linearly independent columns also will have pivots. So it's, it is the same thing, but it's a more sophisticated, sophisticated view of looking at the rank or defining rank, which will be useful starting next week. Of course, we cannot have more independent rows and columns than the actual total that we have. So the rank has to be less than or equal to the minimum of the number of rows and number of columns. And we saw two important properties. One is that the rank of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of the ranks and that the rank of the gram matrix and the other gram matrix and the matrix and its transpose they are all the same which is an important property that uh, we will need to keep in mind okay okay then we did the gauss jordan elimination to compute matrix inverses actually we started with uh, solving equations using gauss jordan then we saw that solving equations is the same as computing uh, inverses so we could compute inverses also so gauss jordan elimination will give you a reduced row echelon form while Gauss to, Gaussian elimination gives you row echelon form plus the back substitution implemented that would be Gauss Jordan elimination. Then we saw this important result that Gauss Jordan running on A augmented by I will give you the inverse of A. We saw the cofactor adjugate kind of expression for the inverse of a matrix that is called 1 over determinant of A times the transpose of the cofactor matrix which is the adjugate matrix. As you can see, the determinant comes in the denominator here and if the determinant is zero, the inverse is not defined because it appears in the denominator, okay? So in that case, we will call the matrix bad names, singular, non-invertible, even degenerate matrices, okay? Then we saw the Kramer's rule, beautiful mathematically, but kind of useless computationally. So it basically just says the solution to the jth element of the vector that will satisfy the system of linear equations is aj made a determinant divided by the determinant of a aj being the matrix with the jth column replaced by the coefficient matrix uh, the co the const constants vector let me repeat this the jth element of the solution vector is the determinant of aj divided by the determinant of a aj is a matrix of the coefficients a with the jth column replaced by the constants vector b Good. Then we also looked at various shapes of matrices, tall, square, and wide, and looked at this, the, the properties of their canonical forms. Okay? If, it is an, if it is not a full rank matrix, there is no clean separation between the identity matrix that is hiding inside the RREF and the free variable columns in general. At times, you might get uh, the identity matrix cleanly separated, but not always. So that's what we learned. 